Hi, I'm Greg Albrecht. Welcome to CWR Christianity Without the Religion. Many years ago, a young man arrived at a small Christian college. He was an incoming freshman, but he was so filled with himself, he was so filled with self importance at his young age that when he set foot on the campus, you would have thought if you'd seen him marching across the campus that he was a new professor just joining the faculty. But he found that the campus was almost deserted. And he found that it was rather small and humble. And he pulled his paperwork out of his suitcase and he realized that he'd mistakenly arrived two weeks early. Classes weren't even going to begin. Or actually, New Student Week and orientation wasn't even going to begin for two weeks, classes for three weeks. So he walked around and decided he was there and he would have to go find housing in town or something And for a couple of weeks. But he thought, well, I'm on the campus. I'll walk around. And he was amazed how small and how old the buildings were. He was expecting multi-story, ivory-covered brick buildings. But some of these buildings look like old military barracks. Some of them look like they're about ready to fall down. He was disappointed. He thought, I'm going to be wasting my time and all my efforts and my intellect in a place like this. So he finally, walking around, needed a men's bathroom, and he found one. The door was open, and that was a welcome sight. He just finished a long trip on the bus, and so he went into the bathroom to use the facilities. And as the young man went in, he actually saw the first real live human being he'd seen on the campus, a middle-aged man who looked for all intents and purposes like a janitor, was on his hands and knees, scrubbing the bathroom tiles. So after the young new student used the facilities and was washing his hands, the young man looked down at the janitor and said, Hi, I'm a new student. I guess I've made a mistake. I thought this was new student week, and it looks like I've arrived a couple of weeks early. You know, I'm sure the president must be in his office. If you could tell me where his office is, I'd like to go and meet him and let him know I'm here. The man looked up from his hands and knees, and he said, You know, I'm sure the entire campus community is going to be delighted to hear of your arrival and all the other new students. As far as the president's office is concerned, I can give you directions, but I can assure you he's not in his office. The new student said, well, why not? He's the president. College is going to be starting in a couple of weeks, and I thought that the president would be busy getting ready. The older man said he is getting ready for the start of classes. Many of our staff is taking a well-deserved break before the beginning of school so that the president has decided there are more pressing duties he can attend to than being in his office. The new student still didn't get it. He was still puzzled, and he responded, well, what could be more important for the president of this college than making plans for a new school year? The middle-aged man again paused from his scrubbing, and he said, the president decided that the bathroom needed to be scrubbed down and painted. That's why I'm not in my office today. Today we're going to talk about the highest calling. We're going to read and discuss our passage in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10, verses 35 through 45. Let's pray. Our loving, gracious, and merciful Father in heaven, you constantly provoke and arrest our attention by directing our focus away from those activities and pursuits we find to be significant and important to issues that we frankly find trivial and not worthy of our time. And we're humbled as we read about the life and teachings of Jesus because in Christ you revealed yourself and your priorities. And today we focus on one of the more critically important dimensions in the life of a Christ follower. Give us eyes to see a more complete spiritual vision and ears to grasp a deeper sense of your calling. This we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. I heard the story of the Bible college president scrubbing down the bathroom a few weeks before the beginning of a new semester of classes decades ago. It's a true story, and I've always loved it 
for many reasons on many different levels. But it always reminds me when I remember it of our keynote passage. And in studying this keynote passage in reverse, if you like, that's why I was reminded of the story. Our keynote passage is in Mark chapter 10, verses 35 through 45. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you? he asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said. Can you drink of the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, You will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with, but to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they've been prepared. When the ten, there were twelve disciples and James and John had already asked him this rather impertinent question. When the ten heard about what had gone on, beyond their knowledge, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them all together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be the first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. The audacious request of the two brothers James and John was no surprise to Jesus, He had earlier, as we read in Mark chapter 3, verse 17, a few chapters earlier in this Gospel of Mark, Jesus had already called them or named them or given the nickname Sons of Thunder to James and John. Given their fiery and impulsive outbursts, James and John lived up to their name. These two young men were certainly not timid or shy. As we read this story, with the benefit of almost 2,000 years of hindsight, we're shocked at this bold, presumptuous request. But let's just put ourselves in their shoes for a moment. From their perspective, why shouldn't they ask to be seated next to Jesus? After all, they loved him and they were captivated by his leadership and his teachings. Jesus himself had talked to them and all the disciples about the kingdom of heaven and kingdoms According to James and John and all they knew about kingdoms, kingdoms needed visionary leaders who were bold and could make tough decisions, and that's what they thought of of themselves as being good leaders, strong leaders, decisive leaders. So it may well have seemed reasonable to James and John to ask Jesus to allow them to be his top two assistants. After all, Jesus would want his kingdom to be successful, wouldn't he? It's always interesting to carefully consider Jesus Responses to questions. And this is no exception. When James and John asked Jesus to give them whatever they asked, an open ended request, Jesus didn't lecture them about selfishness and immaturity. He didn't tell them to be more precise in what they were asking. He just simply said, Well, what exactly do you want me to do for you? When James and John advanced their bold request to be given, the two most important positions in Jesus' kingdom, Jesus continued to respond graciously, somewhat like that president of the college who was scrubbing out the bathroom on his hands and knees to the young freshman who had just utilized the facilities that the president himself had cleaned. Jesus told James and John they really had no idea what they were talking about. They had no idea what they were asking for. These two brothers thought it was a straightforward matter. They just wanted Jesus to appoint them to be the top dogs in the kingdom. All they wanted to be was the biggest of the big wheels. Jesus said, you know, there's far more to your request than you may have considered. And so in many ways, all of us 
are like James and John. You don't think you are? Well, you are, and so am I. Don't we often pray to God and ask Him to give us exactly what we want? I don't know about you, but I still do. This conversation between James and John and Jesus reminds me that I often have no idea what I'm asking for. Jesus told these two brothers there was far more to their request than they realized. He told James and John that following him was not going to be a grand and glorious day at the beach. Following Jesus is not the same as riding next to him in a victory parade as the crowds cheer and applaud. Following Jesus is not one and the same as barking out orders from a throne in some sumptuous palace for others to obey. Following Jesus involves sacrifice, suffering, and service. That's a part of what James and John didn't realize they were asking for. Then the rest of the disciples heard about James and John's behind-the-scenes request, and they were trying to ensure that they were the most important bigwigs in Jesus' kingdom. And again, we can learn a great deal from their response to James and John compared to Jesus' response to James and John and to the rest of the disciples. The disciples were angry. They were angry, not because James and John were presumptuous, but because they hadn't thought of asking for those jobs themselves before James and John did. They were angry because they wanted to be the ones to sit on the right and the left hand of Jesus. After this ugliness of self-serving human nature was fully out there for everyone to consider. It was fully on display. Jesus then patiently explained to all of his disciples that his kingdom is like no other kingdom. His kingdom is a complete repositioning of values and principles of earthly kingdoms. His kingdom is, as it has been called, an upside down kingdom. Jesus' kingdom is a kingdom where power is not defined by riches and fame. Jesus' kingdom is a kingdom where leaders are servants. Let's read verses 41 through 45 again. When the ten heard this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them all together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. When I was a teenager, I was introduced to a book that I was told, well, this book Others told me was, next to the Bible, the most important book that could shape and control my future. This book, written by a man named Dale Carnegie, was and is titled, it's still a popular book and has been for many, many decades, How to Win Friends and Influence People. The central thesis of the book and of courses that are taught by teachers that will help you learn it beyond the book, learn this principle, this technique, if you like, this methodology of winning friends and influencing people, the central thesis of the book is that in order to be successful in this world, you must become a person of influence. And in order to become successful and rich and famous, according to how to win friends and influence people, you must learn how to use other people, how to manipulate them so that they will do what you want them to. They will react in the way that you want them to. And so in the end, they will serve you and your needs. How to win friends and influence them and get them to do what you want them to do and make you healthy and wealthy and successful is essentially what the book is all about. It took me many decades. It took beyond that. In fact, it didn't take me many decades. It didn't take me at all. It took lavish gifts of God's grace and dark walks in the valley of the shadow of death, the death of my 
self-serving, self-centeredness, which isn't dead yet, unfortunately, (laughs) to dispel the notion that greatness amounts to other people liking you, listening to you, responding to you, and doing what you want them to do, getting that whole thing out of my mind. The mind of Christ had to replace this self-centered idea. And in my mind, the mind of Christ is gradually over time, by God's grace, taking root. It's not completely there yet. God's not finished with me, and I suspect he's probably not finished with you either. But the mind of Christ is the focus of our passage today. The highest calling, the title of our message today, according to Jesus, is just this, serving God and serving others. The great commandments of the New Covenant are loving God and loving our fellow human beings. These commandments are an unnatural response for any human. Therefore, the commandments of Jesus can only be followed as and when Jesus lives his life of service within us, when his mind is within us. The highest calling, as modeled and exemplified by Jesus, is not to be served. It's not to manipulate other people into getting them to do what you want them to do for you. It's not to influence people so that they'll wind up doing what you'd like them to do. The highest calling is not to be served. The highest calling is to serve. And as we read elsewhere in the Gospels, the service to which we're called by virtue of following Jesus is not service based on response. Let me explain what that means. Jesus doesn't commission us to serve only those people who are appreciative and grateful. He never talked about how to avoid the nasty people who will never appreciate our service and just to serve the nice ones and how to identify the nice ones who would really appreciate it and to serve them more. Jesus never told the disciples to expect everyone they serve to be nice and thankful and appreciative. Jesus did say he would enable us, his followers, to love and that our goal in a life filled with and directed by the mind of Christ, would be to love everyone. But he never told us to expect that everyone would be lovable. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 44, he said that he would enable us, as he lived within us, to love and pray for even our enemies. Jesus was fully aware that he and his followers, including you and me, would have enemies. Thus, the high calling we're given by Jesus is to become influential, but in precisely the opposite way of being influential that the kingdoms of this world prescribe, and specifically that the book that Dale Carnegie wrote prescribes. The kingdoms of this world, as discussed in How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie, direct us to become powerful and influential by having other people follow us and do what we want them to do. The kingdom of heaven directs us to become powerful and influential by being servants. That's our high calling. Jesus calls us to serve, to make a contribution rather than to merely consume. 1 Peter chapter 4 verse 10 instructs Christ followers to Quote, use whatever gift you've received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. Now, some are convinced that they haven't been given any gifts, and so they really can't serve other people. Others are waiting for somebody to tell them what their gifts are and maybe deputize them, maybe put a badge on them or some stripes on their sleeve, along with a title and an assignment, so that they can go out and serve. But there are many ways in which all of us can serve. If we have the gift of time, we serve with that. We talk with others. We listen to them. We pray with them. If we have a talent in some way as a gift, we serve with that talent. Perhaps we're talented in teaching and reading and singing and cooking and sewing and hospitality. Maybe we can just make a really good cup of coffee or tea. Perhaps we have treasures physically we've been given. We can 
used to help others. John Wesley, the founder of what is known as the Methodist Church and that denomination, once said the following, Do all the good you can, by all the means you can, by all the ways you can, in all the places you can, and at all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as you ever can. Now, in case you might think that such advice is legalism and works-based Christianity, permit me to explain, because, first of all, I'm not about works-based Christianity at all. If you're a part of CWR for any length of time, you know that. If we think that doing all the good we can, by all the means we can, by all the ways we can, and all the places we can, at all the times we can, to all the people we can, as long as we ever can, somehow earns us a place of standing with God, if we think our works of service are a way of impressing God so that He will eventually reward us with high honors, like, for example, sitting on the right hand and left hand of Jesus, as James and John (laughs) requested, then we're barking up the tree of performance-based religion. But if we believe that the mind of Christ in us will lead us to do all the good we can by all the means we can, by all the ways we can, and all the places we can, and at all the times we can, to all the people we can, as long as we ever can, then we are close to that very mind of Christ. We're not saved by our works. We're saved by grace, but we are saved by grace for works. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10 speaks of our salvation by God's grace as being for the purpose of us becoming transformed of and by God into his workmanship, his handiwork, so we can become tools he can use as his own hands and feet in this world. When he was a young man, William Penn who lived in London at the time and who would later become the founder of the state we know as Pennsylvania, was asked by a friend if he would take him to a Quaker meeting. William Penn was a Quaker then and continued to be throughout his life. Today, they're also known as friends. One of the Quaker distinctive traditions and teaching is to be quiet and listen to God. Some might call this activity meditation. The Quakers or friends generally call the time they gather together a meeting rather than a worship service. By contrast, many other Christians talk about going to church and going to church services. So, it was many years ago the friend went along to a Quaker meeting with William Penn, and the Quaker meeting, as it predictably was, was completely quiet. No one spoke. Everyone was meditating, and after they'd sat through about an hour of silence, Penn's friend leaned over and whispered to him, When does the service begin? William Penn leaned over and whispered back, As soon as the meeting ends. Let's pray. Dear God, our meeting has now ended. May service in your name begin. Live in us that we may, in our own ways, given our respective gifts and abilities, reach out and serve others in your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're thankful to be of service to you, all of you, and we pray for you so often, and we give thanks to God for the part that you play in this ongoing work, and we are reaching out and meeting and touching so many lives with the grace of God, and we're thankful that you enable us and support us in doing that, support us with your prayers and financially, and thank you for that. We want to invite all of you, in addition to any friends you have, to join us next week. And the United States of America will be in the midst of Thanksgiving season. You and Canada will have already observed it. Next week, our message is titled, Giving Thanks to the Master. It's based on Luke chapter 17, verses 7 through 10. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen.